Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Duffy Robbins, one of our Bible teachers from our preaching team. We are so glad to have you back with us today. Always a pleasure. Yeah, Thank you welcome very much, back. Lord. How's your summer? Good? It's good. It's been fantastic. A lot of fun, great ministry, um, refreshing. It's been awesome. It's good. Been well, great. I certainly enjoyed uh, your sermon and the stories um, about your grandkids. That was awesome. Good. That uh, yeah. was funny. Um, and so you talked about this blockbusters, uh, these yeah. summer blockbusters. And the one we looked at today was David and Bathsheba. Um, we had some few other questions that just came in kind of specifically around that passage. Okay, great. Um, so I'll start with those. Um, someone asked, why did God send Nathan after David's multitude of sins and not before he committed adultery? Uh, great question. I don't know. Let's close in prayer. <laughs> no, I, um, I, no, I don't know. I mean, I, I think there are, there are millions and millions and millions of anguished parents who've asked those kind of questions over the years mm. of children who made all kinds of bad choices and paid a very, very high tuition to learn important lessons. Um, and, uh, and, and so one might ask, well, why, why, you know, why that happened then? Uh, why, why didn't God convert Chuck Colson, you know, before so that he could have maybe, uh, you know, maybe had an influence on Richard Nixon and the whole geopolitical history could, those are, those are really important questions, but there are questions that, uh, that no one can honestly, he'd be presumptuous to answer. But I will say this, that I, there are two reasons why I can, I can imagine. Uh, one is that, uh, is that sometimes um, we, we don't call out to God until we get to a really, really mm. bad place. Until we, right, we, that uh, I think as a parent, there are times when I will let my child learn lessons the hard way. Most of us who are parents know that one of the best ways to learn how to make good decisions is by making bad decisions. And so in fact, the very, very, very protective parents are often the parents whose kids end up not learning because uh, in a sense they've protected their child from an encounter with God. Mm. It's like the mother said, I'm not letting my son go near a swimming pool until he learns how to swim. Well, guess what? You don't learn how to swim without getting near a swimming pool. You know, and they go, yeah, but he might get in over his head. That's right, that's mm. right. But it's not until you are in over your head that you start thinking about the importance of swimming and keeping yourself afloat and, and, and so, uh, or the need for a lifeguard. And so I, I think that might be one reason why. Um, of course, we go, yeah, but what about all the, you know, what about all the trail of lives that were ruined in the process? Um, and, and, and I don't want to minimize the, the hurt of that or the tragedy of that or the danger of that, but um, that's where I think, um, and this just sounds trite to say it, and I know it, in that sense, it could be taken so wrong, but that's where in the, I think in the, in the governance of God, in the mind of God, there, uh, you know, he can deal with those things. Um, he can deal with those things. He can deal with death. But the hardest thing to deal with is a stubborn person who doesn't want to change their mind. Mm. The other reason um, that God didn't maybe send Nathan earlier is because, uh, is because uh, God, for reasons that we can't begin to fathom exactly, wants to offer us the opportunity to freely choose. Mm -hmm. And uh, even if that means we will freely choose badly, um, it is impossible to love unless you have the option not to love. God desires our love. Uh, and, um, and so unless we have the option not to love him, then um, then he, we don't, you know, we don't have the really the option to love him. So I think it's a free will question. It's uh, is that God wanted David to be low enough that he finally felt like mm -hmm. I've got to look up. And of course, you look at David's life, and there are many, many times when he did look up. But I think uh, it, it's like all of us, you know, that you you uh, 
we need to be refreshed, we need to be renewed, we're never at a place where we can just kind of put it on autopilot. And, uh, and so this, is, this was clearly a point at which David just went down to the pit, which is exactly how he describes it, you know, uh, in, in Psalm 40, I think it is. But so yeah, that, that's, those are two possibilities but the answer is only in the mind of God. Well, that's a great perspective um, to think about. So there's one other question, just talking about David's sin. And as he began, um, just this pattern that continued to unfold. Um, there's a question around that that says, wasn't the start of David's sin the staying and not going into battle like the other kings do? Yeah, I mean, in one sense, it, but it was sort of like, it would sort of be like this and say, you know, when did uh, when did the farmer start growing corn? Did he start growing corn when he went to the store to buy the seed? Did he start growing corn before that when he sat down and said, I wonder what I'll have my crop this year? Or did he start growing corn when the corn actually came up above the ground? It, it's, it's, that's, part of, that's what makes it so seductive. That's why I talked about the boa constrictor, is that, you know, your head's not in, so you're, oh, you know, it, you know, it's the old uh, story of the window washer who fell from the top of the building and at the 58th floor, he said, so far, so good, you know, is that uh, we sometimes think, oh, the, until I splatter, mm -hmm. that's, the, you know, the wage of sin is death. Mm -hmm. but, but the beginning of the fall is what uh, ultimately led to the splatter. And so, so yeah, that was, that was clearly a you know, clearly a bad decision in retrospect. And I think it was, a, but, it, but, but there's nothing necessarily sinful about, you know, not going to war. Somebody go, no, of course he didn't go to war. He's a pacifist, you know, or whatever, I don't know. So there's nothing necessarily inherently sinful about that decision. Um, uh, it, not, in, in, any more than there was anything inherently sinful about standing on the roof. Um, but, but it was indicative, I think, of a David who was kind of coasting because other kings should have, any king would have been out there on the field of battle and he was kind of coasting. And uh, uh, so, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit kind of hard to say, um, you know, does, is a child born at the moment of conception or does it happen, you know, three weeks later or does it not happen until the child emerges from the womb? We don't actually meet the sin until you know, he actually sends for, you know, Bathsheba, mm -hmm. but it's conceived way Much before earlier. that. Yes. Yeah. Good. Um, so we talked a lot about today just, um, and even prayed at the end for, um, you know, anything that may be sorting to slide us down a path like that. Um, but the question comes around about if someone that you know or that you love is beginning to enter one of these cycles, how do you suggest, um, what do you do? Yeah, yeah. And again, you know, um, there's no, there's no, uh, you know, happy uh, three-step plan, you know, but, but um, one thing that I note, and and I might add that uh, we see the same pattern in Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son. In that story, the father is the is, is sort of the, the the image of God. He's the person of God. God didn't say when the younger son said, "Give me everything. I'm taking off." God didn't say, no, I can't let you do that. Son, you're going to make bad decisions. You're going to be with pigs. God said, the father said, okay, all right, you know. And, and again, the principle is the same. Sometimes until you're face down in pig shoe shoe, you don't realize it was a lot better at the father's house. And so I think uh, one of the uh, principles that would uh, will guide someone in that situation and every parent and everybody that loves anybody has seen has been in that situation, is to say, um, sometimes you have to let people go to the low place as much as that hurts. Oswald Chambers has a, uh, he has a, a, a phrase where he talks about being an amateur providence, you know, where we try to jump in and rescue people. And, and we can't be God, we can't be the Messiah. And, um, and so that's the first thing I think mm -hmm. is that we have to allow people some time to leave. Um, are, are there, again, now I'm speaking in, for parents who might be watching who have a child that they think they're having this Bathsheba chapter. Are there times when, when it's right and important to step in? 
Yeah, I think there are some times when as a parent I would prevent. If my, if, my, if my children are out in the highway or out in the road, you know, and a truck comes barreling down the street and, and my wife says, you know, definitely do something. I don't go, hey, I got to learn sometime. You know, and then I try to, you know, sort of bend over and say, see what kids are telling, you know, daddy's trying to teach you kids. That's not a teachable moment. That, that, that's, there's no redemption possible at that point. So I might at that point say, yeah, you're going to have to jump in. But, uh, but, but I think sometimes, you know, we want to jump in before, before people are really going to learn. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's nothing like, uh, there's nothing like combat to get you interested in how your rifle works. Sometimes people have to be under fire before they will really learn and listen. And so I think part of that is waiting, waiting even though that's very, very hard. Um, <clears throat> as, some, as we observed, Nathan didn't go earlier. I don't know why, but maybe that's part of what it was mm -hmm. that David wouldn't have heard. The other, um, you know, just off the top of my head, the other comment is that, that it's interesting that uh, David went, uh, Nathan went to David. Um, we, um, we, you know, we suppose I'm going to say we're going to have somebody come to, you know, we're going to have people come to us. We're going to wait till they go to church. Uh, the Lord sent Nathan to David. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a part of it is that uh, is that by the Spirit of God that Nathan responded to that prompting. And and so part of what, what uh, you know, sort of shapes our response is, is God telling me to do this? And when is God telling me to do it? And do I have the willingness to go to them and say, oh, you know, I'll wait till they come to me? It's, it's, right, that's a part of it. And then the third, just off the top of my head, is that, is that the way Nathan did this with David uh, was quite brilliant. Uh, he, he, he didn't use a frontal assault. He told him a story. Um, and, and if you read 2 Samuel chapter 12, you know, once upon a time there was a man with sheep. Uh, that, I think, um, is also instructive that the power of story, the power of testimony, the power of saying, here's how, here's how God has worked in my life, or here's, mm -hmm. here's, here's a story of how it works. Um, people will, could sit through 10 sermons mm. and not get it but they hear your story that or a story and they go, mm -hmm. holy cow, mm -hmm. that man That's deserves it. to die. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, that man <laughs> is you, you know? So, so uh, yeah, those are three quick ideas that come to mind. Good. Um, so for our last question, we had an interesting saying come in. Um, there's an old saying that says, you can't clean a home with a dirty mop. So, holy cow, that <laughs> Brilliant. So in considering um, point three in the sermon today, um, do you find that relatable? How, how does that connect? You can't clean a home with, with a, a dirty, dirty mop. mop. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, here's, um, here's what I think um, this may mean. Um, well, I get the idea that you can't clean a home with a dirty mop. And if you have a dirty mop, you sweep it, everything is going to get dirtier. The third point in my message today, if you want to, if you haven't heard it already, you can listen to it online. But uh, the idea is that uh, is that sin confuses us into thinking that we're in control of events that are out of our control, and I think that means that we are the dirty mops, mm -hmm. and that uh, that how can we clean our own house? And the answer is we can't. We need a savior. Uh, David, when he prayed and praised God for his salvation in this incident said, you know, he has lifted me out of the desolate pit, out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock. When you're in quicksand, you can't pull yourself out. If you're a dirty mop, you can't clean your house. You need a savior. You need Jesus. And I think, mm -hmm. I think uh, this is part of the, the, uh, the truth, the hard truth of the gospel, but it's also a wonderful truth. We can't, we can't save ourselves, but here's the wonderful fact is God sent us a savior to save us when we could not. And uh, we don't deserve it. Um, and, we, and sometimes we're running from it, mm. but he came to pursue us. Just like the Lord sent Nathan to David, the Lord sent Jesus to us. That's awesome.
What a Thank great you. connection. Okay, so you're back with us next week. Oh, that's right. That's right. Blockbuster part two. Cliffhanger, yep. leaving us on the yeah. edge of our seats. Okay, so um, thank you for being with us here today. Be Certainly back, enjoyed right? it, and we're looking forward to what you bring next week. Thank you. Yes, and thank you for your questions, and thank you for joining us here for Postscript. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.